Okay, folks, it's, let me mute my computer. Uh, it's the bottom of the hour. This is the quick working group session. We have a few people filtering in, but we'll go through some of the admin uh, process first. Uh, my co-chair, Matt, can't be with us. He's had an emergency, so I'm on my own. Have some patience, please, in case I can't use a computer. It's been proven in the past, and I haven't got any evidence that it won't be different this time. Um, let's move on. This is the note well. By now, hopefully, you should have sent in some sessions and be familiar, but if you're not, the note well describes policies and procedures and processes uh, that are uh, for how you participate in the IETF. Uh, there's a bunch of documents on here. If you're not familiar, please go in and have a read, but some of the key points are around the standards process itself, how working groups work, how your contributions and, and uh, rules about IPR work here, um, and importantly, things like the code of conduct and how you're expected to interact with other participants in the IETF um, and this working group especially, because we're here now. Uh, some of the meeting tips, if you're in person, please, please scan the QR code and get registered. This is the effective virtual blue sheets that we used to have. This helps with attendance and to understand if this is the right room size or it's too small, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you can also join the queue from this. This is great because remote participants and on-site people can be uh, mingled because uh, we don't get to mingle enough. Uh, remote participants, similar. Don't share your video if you can avoid it. Please wear some headphones. We like good AV. Administrative video, note takers, Brian Trammell's already kindly volunteered. The link in this document's wrong. Robin's posted one into the Zulu chat, uh, which is great. Um, if anyone else wants to volunteer to help with Brian, just things like typos or fix-ups are always greatly appreciated. Brian says people talk fast sometimes, so if you could take it as a, I don't know, a red, black, striped raid array or something, great. Uh, we've got the blue cheats, chats in the yeah, Echo Zulip. Um, I'll try and run the queue as best I can. <laughs> we'll see how we get on. Uh, the agenda for today is um, chair updates. We're going to spend a little more, bit more time than just this stuff. I've got an, an issue that our AD has asked us to bring up, and maybe we can try and resolve within that timeline. And we're going to get onto working group items. Uh, we're going to have multipath, then stream resets, then QLog, uh, then some other items, potential new work or related work with Quick. So that's NAT traversal, NAT receive timestamps, Quick BDP frame, um, and then two uh, presentations about FEC if we get to the time and I can get the slides in loaded up and show. Um, we'll see how we get on with that. Is there any agenda bashing for that? I don't see anything. Okay, great. Update since the last meeting is that the act frequency has gone into working group last call. Uh, we managed to drain the queue of issues, so that's been good work from the, the authors there. Thank you very much. That working group last call is, is still running. We wanted to run it before the IETF in case anything came up and we would have an opportunity this meeting to discuss either in the meeting or around the meeting. Um, I think there's one issue that probably needs a bit of discussion, but we're not gonna take any time right now to do that. I think we can try and sort that out in the corridor or maybe take it offline. Um, but please, now's a great chance. We heard previously that uh, working group last call was kind of for some implementers, this is when they would start to look and they wanted to wait and think, fill things stabilized. Uh, please do, the more interop, uh, or implementation experience we have with these things, all the better. Um, On to the other, the other item I mentioned, our errata reports. Uh, we had one raised by Martin Seaman about the multiplexing quick. This was a while ago. I don't know if Martin, you still have some opinions, but I'm going to try and present kind of where we got to before uh, life got in the way for various people. Um, there is a list discussion here linked uh, up on the quick list. Go and read if you don't believe my summary, that's fine, I won't be offended. Uh, but effectively, to give some background here, this is around DMUX. So we have something in, in quick long header packets called the quick bit. Uh, and it's uh, for all long header packets except for version negotiation, the draft says it must be set to one. Um, and the reason for this is that it allows quick to coexist with other protocols. The scenario here is, um, 
you know, listening on a single port number and receiving packets that are intended for different UDP-based applications and um, fitting in with an existing demultiplexing profile uh, described by RFC 7983. And this, this is fine. It, it, this bit we picked means that we're in the number range that uh, won't be accidentally forwarded to uh, RTP or something like that. Um, vision negotiation packet is a bit different. The spec says where quick might be multiplexed with other protocols, uh, servers should set the most significant bit um, and that there's no requirement on other versions to make a similar recommendation. And so the concern here, uh, sorry, the, and this is the, the, the defluxing, the DMUX model. Uh, if you notice the RFC number is different than what was described in quick, uh, it's already kind of in a, a slight desync situation where the, the, the recommendations for UDP demuxing were updated after Quick was updated. So there's always an opportunity to update doc references. I don't think that's a, the, the high order bit here, but effectively um, the problem we have is that the, the server can't know what the client is muxing. It doesn't have the correct information to know if it should set the bit to one or zero, um, which is just kind of a bit sucky, especially when the spec says it doesn't really provide any information there. Um, so there are a number of proposed solutions were put on the mailing list. Some of them were made and subsequent discussion may have uh, ruled those proposals out. I didn't want to make that call. I just wanted to survey all of the ones I could find this morning and, and get ready. So one of them was to change RFC 9000 to, um, towards always setting uh, the bit to one um, and to remove this sub clause where you know, we might say, oh, where other protocols might be used. Another option was to change the logic in RFC 9443 to, um, to kind of effectively change the definition that I just had up on this slide and change something. Uh, that's not quick. That's going to require a lot more time and effort if we decided to go that route. Um, another option was to change RFC 9000 to say you must set the bit unless there's some out of band knowledge that you could have um, that's different than what we do now. It would upgrade a should to a must. And then finally, um, kind of the one that was the last thing on my mind, um, and I think was discussed on the list, was that we just change uh, the text that decorates that should to provide a bit more information towards implementers about why uh, setting it to zero or one might help or not, depending on out of band knowledge. And that if people want to take risks and make guesses, that's fine, but they, they understand what they're, they're asking themselves for. So I think it would be great now if anyone has strong opinions on this to come and speak at the microphone and say, maybe the people need some time to digest it. We could take it to the list, but we just wanted to um, bring this back up so we didn't forget, so we can just make, take action and move on. If this needs to be held for document update, Zaha, you can remind me of the current state. I think it's held for document update. We should decide what we actually want to do now. Um, yeah, uh, Mira? Mira Kulevin, no strong opinion, but four. Okay. Uh, Kazuo? Kazuo, uh, I also think four is good uh, because when we designed RFC 9000, we thought that uh, the demuxing thing is a going concern, where as uh, budget negotiation is going to be baked into the protocol for a longer time. Thank you. Martin Duke? Yeah, I'm sorry. So to clarify, this is just for version negotiation packets? Just for version negotiation packets, because they're the, the odd child of our long headers. <sighs> OK, uh, then I'm going to say probably uh, number three. but. Any of these are fine. I agree there's something needs to change. Okay, thanks. Alessandro Guidini, Cloudflare. I'm not sure, do we actually need to do anything? Um, like when it says where quick might be multiplexed with other protocols, isn't that equivalent to, you know, unless out of band knowledge clause? Yeah, I think the, the text we might come up with as a proposal clarify that point. Mm. I, I had some prepared. I didn't want to put them up here. I didn't want to take the opinion, but. Yeah, so I, I mean, I don't really care that much, but four seems like the better option. Okay, thanks. Uh, Christian? 
well, I'm for option four as well, if we have to do something, but what's happening? I'm for option four as well, but uh, I, I would like to point out that version negotiation as defined is probably a mistake because it's a uh, clear text packet, no authentication. It's a great attack vector to take down an ongoing handshake. So maybe we should think about that too. Okay, so we open the complete can of worms on version negotiation. Is that what I'm hearing? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, I'll consider that one tonight over a strong beverage. Thanks. Uh, Martin Seaman. Well, th th there's a lot of ways to bring down a quick handshake in the early stages, so I'm not sure if we need to fix version negotiation uh, in particular here. Um, I, I have a strong preference for option three because four sounds like, um, if you're running an implementation, sounds like you probably don't need to do anything, and you do. If you're running a, a publicly reachable quick server, you don't know what the client is demultiplexing on the same socket. Okay. Uh, David Skenazi. David Skenazi, quick enthusiast. I, you know, changing RFCs is great and all, but that doesn't change what implementations are doing. Uh, do we have any data on what the like common servers are doing these days? Because the specific case where I see this being relevant is someone doing a peer-to-peer -peer application where they're multiplexing on both sides. Like in most cases, the client isn't multiplexing. And if they're doing that, they don't care what the RFC says. They'll set the bit to one on the server and be done with it. So it doesn't make sense to modify the RFC. So like, what's the motivation for doing all this work and figuring this out? Like, do we even care? I My, my, my take just personally not as chair is that like we want uncoordinated endpoints to be able to work on the internet and that it could be an issue and that the, the, the changes that we're discussing are not to the key protocol itself but just clarifying an intent that we probably had uh, the question do we have data is amazing um, we just saw in the map rg earlier this morning people looking at spinbit maybe looking for version negotiation frames it's could be of interest, but I wouldn't want to block this on that. If it assists the decision making, fab. But yeah, thanks, David. Uh, Jonathan Lennox. Uh, yeah, Jonathan Lennox. First of all, I don't think nobody's recommended it, but I just want to reemphasize not two because the next four bits are the sequence number and half the timestamp, which could validly be zero. Obviously, not likely, but you know, one in two to the thirty second or whatever. Um, and uh, um, the other is that it's not clear to me that um, there's ever a situation where you're not muxing, but your peer is, because 9443 already says you need to pay attention to what five tuple you got it on. And, you know, because that's how you distinguish quick from turn. So, I mean, you know, if you know that, you know, on this five tuple, it's just a quick server and it's not muxing with anything, then. You just always treat it as quick and don't worry about it. It's only when you actually have things running over the same five tuple that you need to worry about this stuff. So, yeah, I think the if my, my recollection of the concern is that the client is listening on the same port and the server can't know. Yeah, but it's listening on the same port, but it still knows what IP and port it got something from. It, it yeah. knows, hey, this IP and port is a quick server. That IP and port is, you know, RTP. Correct, but but if you say had a, a local process using the same source port uh, for quick and RTP, uh, and those things were being packed yeah, I, I, to yeah, them, that, you, you, maybe, you yeah. could end up forwarding yeah. packets to the wrong thing. That that was my understanding. Um, it sounds like there's some interest here, maybe some emerging feel. I, I think that's good input and direction, and we'll carry this discussion on the list. Uh, thank you all. Um, and with that, that's the end of the chairs section. So next up is multi-path. Need to switch slides. You in fact? Sorry, yeah, me. Uh, 
Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Yomei from Alibaba. Uh, today, Mia and I will introduce the uh, Multitask Intention for Quick this time. Next slide, please. Mm, uh, as, as usual, we will introduce the difference between 05 to 06 and the interop reports this episode and about the talk about the open issues and the discussions and, uh, and the next steps. Next slide, please. Yeah, uh, actually the difference from 05 to 06 is quite small. The most important difference we have made is, we, is that we add two new frame types, the pass standby and pass available. Uh, actually, we split the, the pass status frame into two new frames. The pass standby is exactly the same with the standby status from pass status frame. And the pass available frame is exactly the same with the available status of the pass status frame in the previous draft. Uh, and the uh, how to use them are exactly the same way. And, and also, uh, I want to make sure one point is that uh, pass status are recommendations from the receiver side to the sender side about the pass usage for sending data. Uh, that means uh, these these pass status frames uh, just influence the the sending the data sending uh, about the pass uh, about the uh, stream frames and the data datagrams, and you can always send all the control frames from quick transport on all the passes freely. Yeah, the, the second point is that we make it clear that any frame can be sent on a new pass at any time when the anti amplification limits and congestion control limits are respected. Uh, so in quick, uh, in quick multi-pass extension, we share the same security consideration with quick transport. And we want to make sure that uh, it does not mean that you can initial, in, in, in init new passes from the server side, uh, just client side could init new passes. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, uh, at this point, we doesn't make any change. Uh, we just make it clear that as pass is determined by four turbo, and points could use different ports with the same IP address when using multi-pass extension. Uh, that would be more convenient for people to test on their devices, which has only just one IP address. Yeah, next slide, please. Yeah, and we uh, we have an in interrupt test in this hackathon about Daryl 6. Actually, we have nine cases at this time. It's quite complete. Uh, we add uh, pass status and the key update and the CID change and the CID retirement cases for this time. And we have done a full table for these, these four implementations. Um, and sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I had to finish. Yeah, uh, and active. Uh, act I'm sorry. Sorry, sorry. <laughs> yeah, uh, and uh, and we have four implementations participate in this times in, in this times interrupt test about people quick as quick Rask and creature, and, and everybody has done a good job, and we really encourage more impl implementations could join this interrupt test, and also we had a pull request for the interrupt test runner about the multi-pass cases. People could use that way to test later after the hexo. Yeah, and I will let the issues for Mia. Yeah. Perfect, thank you. Now we can go to the next slide. So uh, good news is we have about 25 issues open, but a lot of these are either for like a completely different draft <laughs> or are mostly editorial, uh, small changes and so on. But we have one big issue and that's the one about, do we want to have an explicit pass ID? So at the moment, uh, the connection ID is basically defining the packet number space, and that has some implications. So first of all, it also impl uh, imp impacts the decryption because the CID is used as a nonce. 
every time you change this, you also have to change your encryption. Um, then it also has an impact for loss detection. So every time you change your CID, it might be actually harder to figure out if a packet was lost or not, because you suddenly have a new packet number space. And then also during net rebindings, um, if you have, have to have a net rebinding and a um, connection IDs change at the same time, then it's not clear if that is considered as a new path or not. And that's also another open issue we have, but it's connected to this one. Um, so there was also a proposal to just not do, <laughs> change the connection ID. And I don't think that's the way we want to go forward. It's still an open issue, but I hope we can close it because uh, we have this rotation mechanism for avoiding linkability. And I think we want to keep that property from RFC 9000. Um, there is an alternative proposal. Actually, it's kind of more or less the same proposal in two different issues. Uh, and the alternative proposal is to actually uh, have an explicit path ID and that also means you change the path management. You have to like have new frames for all the frames where you provide the path, the connection ID, and you have to add a path ID to it. And that does change. Uh, that does solve all the problems above, um, but it adds a little bit of more state complexity, however you want to call it. So the real question is, and we are a little bit split on this. We have people who say. Yeah, these issues are not that important because con con connection ID changes don't happen very often, so we can handle them in some way. And we have people who say, but we have this nice solution. It adds a little bit of complexity, but let's you know, solve it in a clear way. Clear way. So what do you want to do? Uh, so I think we discussed about this specific proposal 214 in the previous uh, uh, previous uh, IGF, and there seemed to be slightly more people arguing against it. And since then, we haven't made any progress. So I kind of wonder how we can make progress now without closing the issue. Um, so I mean, that's exactly the problem, right? We discussed this last time, and we seem to be split. So the chairs have to tell me what to do. Uh, but maybe one more point I want, and like maybe we do a hum today or something, I don't know. Um, but one, one point I want to make is that like the option is basically to change the draft or do nothing, right? Um, so changing the draft will be a little bit of work and also needs a little bit of additional implementation effort and testing. So if we do nothing, we are basically done. If we change the draft, we have to change it. Okay, Christian? So I am firmly in the do nothing camp because I, I think that the uh, the hole that we have on CID rotation is kind of by design. The, the purpose there is to do CID rotation so that the, the new pass cannot be correlated with the previous, the, well, the, the new stream with the new CID cannot be correlated with the previous one. To get that property, you have to have some kind of distance between the new paths. So in practice, you are not, you, you don't want to do that when you send one packet with one CID and the next packet with the next CID a microsecond apart. Because, I mean, linking the two together will be trivial. What you want to do is wait and only do that rotation when you have had a long silence. And if you have a long silence, yes, you get the privacy effect. But if you have a long silence, in practice, you also have a new pass. So the fact that you have a new pass if you rotate the CID after a long silence is kind of by design. It's not a bug. It's good. So don't change anything. And let's, let's publish the multicast to have. We have been working on it for way too long. So actually, I want to correct myself. We still have to solve issue 118. But I don't think that's a protocol change. It's just some clarification needed there. Yeah. OK, uh, Martin Seaman. So I don't think the only problem here is the rotation of CIDs on the path. If that was the only problem, I would agree with uh, Christian. But there are a number of, of other issues um, that come up when we don't have path IDs, and I've described them in, in the issue 214 here. Um, I haven't implemented multipath myself yet, but I have thought about how I would implement multipath in Quick Go. And I know that one way would be a lot easier than the other way. And the easier way would be by having explicit path IDs. 
So I'm, I'm strongly in favor of uh, making the changes here. Um, so I think it actually depends a little bit on where your, um, how your implementation works, if it's easy or not. So it might be easier for one implementation, might be harder for the other one. Ian Sweat, Google. Um, I, I'd prefer it without path IDs um, overall. Uh, I do agree the connection ID rotation is slightly annoying, although I think the loss detection uh, change is a implementation dependent change. Like if you change the connection ID, then, but it's the same path, then you can decide if you want to keep the loss detection the same context, the same, you know, you can kind of do things to fix that. Um, and the decryption encryption thing is, I mean, unless you have a ton of CIDs in flight that are different, it doesn't seem overly complex. Um, but I don't know, that's my personal opinion. Uh, Mark Duke, connection ID enthusiast. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I'm, we, we, we definitely have to have CID rotation, uh, not just for the privacy thing, but because like that could break routing uh, if there's a load balancer on the new path. So this is like, this is an absolute like compliance requirement. You can click close if you want, or you can't, right? You can click close on that issue. Which issue? The 273. Uh, what? <laughs> Which one? 273. Yes, Sorry, okay. I, I hit 2073 and had, okay. had a panic. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'm trying to do multiple things at the moment, but I'll take a note to close 2073. Thank you. Yeah, I'm sorry to stand up again, but I just wanted to point out that so this past ID proposal makes certain things easier. That's true. And I, I think so. There's reason for people arguing for it. On the other hand, uh, it does change the data structure. Uh, more uh, different uh, from what we have in quick V1 because there are now two layers of paths. I mean, one being the path group, identified path ID, and then the connection IDs. So the data structure is going to be much different, and they'll be paying for existing quick implementations to support multiple. So this is a trade off. Mike Bishop. Hi, Bishop. I just wanted to point out a difference between what I hear people saying and what I see on the slide. And I think the slide is probably a more useful way to think about this. The proposal is to separate path IDs from connection IDs. We already have a sequence number for the connection ID that identifies the path on which it's being used. You can use that to index things in your data structures. And the proposal here is really for that path ID we already have, do you have one or do you have many connection IDs? If, you, if we choose to say one and you want to rotate CIDs, you generate a new path that looks startlingly similar to the old one, but it has a different CID. I've, this seems like needless complexity unless, unless I'm seriously misunderstanding it. So clarification question, Mike. What, you, you do not believe that path ID is required? I believe we already have a path ID and it's the connection ID sequence number. Okay. So, so do nothing. Okay. Mike said correct. Uh, Christian? Yeah, I mean, I, I agree with uh, what Miria said that we cannot do away with, like, with con CID rotation. What I disagree is that the problem of having simultaneous NAT rebinding and CID rotation is extremely rare if you are sending your packets back to back. Because if you are sending packets back to back, the, the NATS is not going to change the, the binding between two packets. The NATS typically change the binding either when the NAT reboots, I mean, for some reason, or when there is a big silence. When you have a big silence, that is the point in which you might have effectively a new pass. But if you have a big silence, it's also true that your congestion control should change. It's also true that uh, your loss recovery is probably irrelevant because if you had a big silence, you don't have any packets in transit. So I don't think that in fact, we have any practical problem with the current solution. I totally agree with you. <laughs> So we're not disagreeing. And um, the, the problem that we still need to solve is if you, if you are in this situation, 
you're not sending for a while, you get uh, another rebinding and you use a new connection ID, then one end thinks it's just the same pass and the other, way, other end will see a new pass. And so you also have the old pass still there, which might not work anymore. And so what we need to describe in the draft is how to detect this quickly and then only use the new pass. So, but that's, I think, an editorial or like recommendation work, it's not changing the protocol. Look, I mean, if that is really a problem in practice, we can always do an extension with a new frame that, that should be say, hey, this particular path is a continuation of the previous one. If that was really a, a problem. I do not believe it's actually a problem. We have interrupt with the current solution. I, I don't think it's real. Okay, thanks, Anita. Um, Jeff, you again. Yeah, I just w want to point out a few a few more problems. So, um, with our path IDs, we don't have an um, we don't have an explicit um, limit on the number of paths. Um, the number of paths is only limited by the number of connection IDs, which um, is probably higher than the number of paths that you want to allow. So, the the resource management um, aspects of ha not having path IDs are strictly worse. Um, not having a path ID also can lead to this really weird situation where you receive a path status, path standby, or path abandon frame uh, with a um, connection ID sequence number that you have already retired. The point of retiring is that you can clean up state in your, in your stack, and um, it is not clear to me how you can, um, how you can do that uh, without the path ID, because you need to remember, you, you need to remember the sequence numbers of the connection IDs, because you might receive this frame, and frames might might be um, arbitrarily delayed in the network. Um, the next point is that uh, loss loss recovery, as described in 9002, is tied to the packet number space. So, I think we all agree that loss recovery on one path. Um, Loss recovery should be per path. Um, so when you when you rotate the connection ID and you also end up in a new uh, packet number space, um, loss recovery suddenly gets um, a lot more complicated. So you you, you might be able to um, to work around this in your stack by having some additional tracking of like oh these two packet number spaces are actually just one space, and uh, do some uh, do some math to to still do do loss recovery there. But it's more complicated than just having a single packet number space. Just to comment on the loss recovery, at least. Uh, so you can either try to track both of them for a little while if you want to be careful, or you just like lose a couple of packets, which is also not a big problem because it shouldn't happen very often. Yeah, and I, I would also point out that uh, Martin, when you said that you remove state in your implementation, it's actually a slate of hand. Because you, you removed state at the cost of maintaining more state for the pass above that. And I think that's equivalent. Cheers. What do we do? Yeah, so I'm, I've been trying to listen and, and collect my thoughts. Uh, as a solo chair, that's hard. But I, I'm hearing there's trade offs. I'm hearing a few people not bother to try and do anything because what we have is kind of good enough. I think it would help to take a show of hands and see how people feel in this room. Um, but I want to make sure I phrase the question correctly. So um, are we? Yeah, yeah. yeah sure. I, I think um, we, might, uh, we might have a decision at this time, but we could make a decision later, uh, maybe in an inter-meeting before the next ITF. I think we still need more experience from the implementations. Actually, it's a trade-off between these two solutions. Okay. Um, I, I, I would be happy to get at least a sense for where the working group stands, because I'm a little bit lost. A sense of what, sorry? Where the working group stands. I mean, this is a couple of voices, but maybe there are more people who have an opinion and didn't come to the mic. So yeah. Yeah, if you do a show of hands or something, I think it would be very helpful. Okay, sure. Uh, we have a few people in the queue. I'll take take them and we'll try and phrase something up. Kazuo? Uh, Kazuo, so it, I, I mean, if we are going to uh, show hands, I, I, I point out that the path ID proposal isn't even a pull request, so we don't know the details. So 
I mean, if we are going to take hands, I, I think probably we can say if we have interest in exploring this possibility or not, but we cannot choose between the two at this moment. That's um, Brian Trammell. That's more or less what I wanted to say, because what I'm hearing is that a lot of the um, a lot of the opinions one way or the other are coming from implementers who are actually trying to make this work. And I think we'll get more information from a future interop. Um, like I, you know, if I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to put my hand up for, um, that's going to be based on just sort of like an arbitrary understanding of the complexity of the situation and complexity is squishy and moves around a lot. Um, so like, I probably won't put my hand up for either of these because I really want to get a signal from, from, uh, the interop on how the, how this affects the implementations. So, but actually that's a good question. Like who would be willing to implement the proposal? Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Cause like, if we're going to, if we're waiting for testing from that, then we need to have something to test. That's a really good point. Yep. I think we can, we can propose those two questions as a show of hands um, and see what people feel. So give me a moment to type. Um, ah, shit. So I'm going to ask, are you interested in exploring path IDs further? Yes or no? Does that seem like a reasonable question? Yes? I'm seeing some nods. Okay. I'm going to start that. Okay. Well, our speakers are saying yes. Yes? Yes. Okay. Give this a few more seconds. Okay, I'm going to stop it there. Um, for the record, oh no, it's gone. Oh no, I can I can still see it. So for the record, uh, of a total of participants of 134, 20 people said yes. 11 people said no, and 103 people had no opinion. Um, I'll take the, the next question and then maybe ask anyone who said no to either of those questions come up and ask why, but let's take the next question first before I forget what it was. Um, a what? A real show of hand. A real I show? I wanted names. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> The question here will be, do you have interest in participating in an interim or interop to explore path IDs? Again, yes or no, clear answers. So we'll start this question. time I'm going to cut that off here. Um, for the record we have 138 participants in the tool and uh, nine yes, 19 no, 110 no opinion plus our speaker said yes so that'll add some more in the yes. I'm not too worried about the no's for this one because people are busy and don't have time or, or an implementation but the, the yes is seems like a, a sizable number actually. But so. we don't have nine implementations right or like maybe we have just let me know. Well, that'd be, that's good useful information as well. So um, if anyone thinks strongly on, on any of that, please join the queue. Otherwise, I think this is useful information that we can take away. 
Mike. Uh, I'll just point out the second question conflated an interim versus interop. So there are probably more people willing to participate in an interim than actually have an implementation that could do interop. Correct. So I, the, um, the point Mary is making is well taken. We should probably separately ask which implementations would be willing to implement a PR if one existed. And that can just be a like two or three people raise their hands. Yeah. Can we have it in the room show of hands who would like to inter inter interrupt with this? Just in their implementation, whether it's open or private. I'm not seeing any hands. Oh, well, I'm seeing half a, half an arm. Sorry, Ted. My hand is also. Okay. Yeah, I agree. Um, so I think the action for the authors is maybe we need a proposal to understand if people would be willing to implement it, but that if you don't know if people want to implement it, then you're probably not motivated to write a proposal up. So we're stalemated, um, which isn't great. Uh, could I ask folks who care about this deeply to, to meet for a coffee maybe afterwards and we can get together and, and figure something out. And yeah, like we, we need to make progress on this. So, uh, Actually, I would, um... There were like around 20 people saying they were interested in exploring that. Correct. So I would like to see more people at the mic line and telling me why they voted yes, if there's any option for this. Brian Trammell, yes enthusiast. Um, so the main reason that, like I said before, you know, the, the judgment that I'm going to make on whether um, whether I'm for or against putting the path ID is sort of a complex, a conceptual complexity versus simplicity thing, not an implementation complexity versus simplicity thing. And uh, I like explicit signaling over implicit signaling, right? That was my judgment. That's why I said that, right? Like if you have a path, you should have a data structure that points at the path. I put my hand up in order to say something different though, uh, to give uh, Lucas, since he is missing a co-chair, uh, a little bit of um, friendly advice from the peanut gallery. An excellent way to fix a stalemate is to say that the no build option is the option that we go with. You can just say, we're going to do nothing. And then if you say we're going to do nothing and people appeal, well, now that you understand that you actually do have a strong opinion in the room. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Christian in the queue as well. If, if anyone else voted yes and has a strong opinion they want to bring to the mic, please enter the queue now. Christian. Okay, I voted no, as you might guess, and I have a strong opinion. And the reason I voted no is that the, uh, the proposal to have an independent pass ID from the CID makes the encryption and decryption part harder, specifically the dec decryption. Because right now, the requirement for the decryption is that the decrypting engine, which is, some, some, which is often offloaded, just needs to know the, CI, the CID number corresponding to an existing CID. And that's something you can do unilaterally by saying, hey, I have this CID, I can forward you, they might be used sometime, you have them, it's immediate. If you disconnect the two, then you have to have state, you have to have a negotiation about what is the pass ID linked to a particular CID. And you need to push that to your decrypting hardware. And that's sizably more complex than whatever data structure you put in your code. So I think there's, there's a, a very strong reason to not take that additional complexity. And that's why I'm really strong against it. Thanks, Ted. Uh, Ted Hardy, also an explicit uh, uh, signal enthusiast, uh, like my friend Brian over here. Um, I put my hand up for yes, I'd like to explore it further in part because I, I see the sequence number and the path ID as doing very similar things and possibly the same. And so I'd like to see a PR where what we basically did was to treat the connection ID as a tuple, where the sequence number and the rest of the connection ID as a tuple function as the current connection ID does. And then from that perspective, take the question of like, what happens when you mutate? If you need to change one but not the other, how does that work? And I, that's why I said to, to Lucas, I'd like to see an actual PR because the, depending on how you do this, if you just duplicate it and have you, you have a separate 
uh, path ID and a connection ID with a sequence number, you, you are in fact creating more complexity. And I, I think that that's potentially problematic. But if you actually treated them as uh, an identifier that's in the form of a tuple, you might be able to avoid that, uh, that com complexity and still get uh, the benefits that I think Martin has pointed out. So uh, I, I would like to see a PR. I, I might be able to help with a coffee and fetch it and bring people to who's got implementations. But I definitely fell into the willing to participate into an interim, not bringing an interop uh, uh, application with me uh, part of the bucket. And I think that's part of why you're seeing uh, a little bit of difference there. Thanks. Yep, noted. OK, um, this is good input. Yes. I mean, um, we don't have a PI right now because it will touch the whole draft. I think what I'll be looking for as a chair is that anyone who did want to explore this further to please help the authors with preparing a PR, whether that just be discussion or something. Um, we can't expect these folks to do it on their own. As we see, some, some people are happy doing nothing um, and nothing will be done in that case. Brian? Please be quick. I'd like to move on to the next yeah. topic. Sorry, I'm just 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 heard another thing that that seems like a possible anti pattern. Would it would it make sense to write up what this sort of tuple based PID CID system would look like without touching the draft, like not having it be a PR, but have it be just like here's a three pager that here's how we'd like to implement it? Because I don't want to I don't want the reason not to do this to be like it's messing with with the draft. If you see what I mean. Right. So I, I think this, I'm, we I'm, might be taking this to coffee. I'm not convinced that Ted's proposal is so much different from what Martin has already written okay. up. I mean, the encoding is different, but I don't think it makes a diff big difference. Okay. So okay. Martin has a quite extensive description of that in the in yep. issue 140, 214, sorry. But uh, what I'm saying is it, it does touch the whole right. draft. Okay. And I think like doing the exercise of actually creating PR to see how much it does touch is what we're missing. And we didn't do that because if people tell us they don't want it, then I don't have to do it, right? But... Yeah. Yep. Okay. So I think somebody has a task there to make a PR and I'm looking at Martin and he's nodding. Oh, amazing. Okay. Thanks. Uh, yeah. That's, you have one more slide, but it's the next steps. And I think we're over time, I'm more happy with these. So um, based on the progress between now and then, the next IETF, we will take a view on last call, but it's cognizant, no, contingent on what happens next. So we we all want this to get done, I think. It's nearly done. I, I really hope people can put some effort in. So thank you all. Um, yeah, thanks, thank speakers. You. Next up, Martin Seaman to talk about reliable stream resets. Uh, if I can find the slides. Here we go. Okay. Yep. Yes. Oh. Sorry, we had somebody in the queue. I wanted to close the queue, but I couldn't find the button. Um, we, we need to move on, Hanu, unless this is related to reliable stream resets. I'd ask you to put it in the, the Java or send it to the mailing list, please. Okay, reliable stream resets. Um, next slide, please. Right. Oh, okay. Okay, a uh, quick recap. In, in quick um, version one, you can reset a stream, which means that um, potentially none of the data that you've sent on that stream is getting delivered to the application. And for various reasons, we want to have a, um, um, an option to say like, yeah, this stream is reset and I'm not gonna transmit everything of it, but like this short piece at the beginning, I am committing to, to transmitting reliably and please deliver that to the application on the other, uh, on the other end. Uh, next slide. So since San Francisco, we've made some progress. Um, in, in the draft version back then, we had two variants of the frames, which allowed you to reset the stream um, with an error code and without an error code. And we, uh, we discussed this and we, we concluded that having a variant that allows you to reset a stream without an error code is kind of ugly. And um, it's not clear how to implement this um, in, in a lot of APIs there around. So we decided to remove that variant and we made the update to the draft. So now we only have one variant of the stream, which is, um, it looks like a reset stream frame with an additional field for the reliable size. 
we also added a lot of text describing the, um, the stream state machine. Um, this is mostly editorial, but necessary to make, um, to make the description as, as rigorous as we, we would like it to be. Uh, we also added some implementation guidance because we, have, we now have uh, at least three implementations um, of various versions of this draft and we run, run into the same problem. So we hope that the implementation guidance can help future implementations to not make the same mistakes. And coming to our favorite bike shed, the name of the frame. It used to be called Reliable Reset Stream. Then we renamed it to Close Stream. And now we have a new name suggested by Martin Thompson. Um, it's now called the Reset Stream at Frame. And I really hope that we can keep this name. I'm, I'm seeing a lot of thumbs up. Thank you, guys. Um, next slide. We have two remaining issues. Um, one is, do we need a stop sending at frame? So this is also a proposal by uh, Martin Thompson. Um, back then it was called the enough frame. And the reasoning is, is the following. So when you have quick version one, you have you, the, um, the, the, the receiver of, of a stream can say like stop sending. Uh, stop sending, sends a stop sending frame and this requests a reset stream frame from the peer. So now that we have a res reset stream at frame, do we need the equivalent for a stop sending at? Which means like, I'm, I'm asking you, yeah, please stop sending on the stream, but deliver the first 100, byte, uh, uh, 100 bytes to me um, reliably. The use case is not as clear cut as for a reset stream at, but there, there is a use case um, that, we, that we came up with. Um, so imagine the situation where um, you're, you're draining, you're draining a, web transport, um, a, a web transport session, you receive the second byte of a stream. You know that you, don't, that, you don't, that you will never want to read from the stream, but for like resource accounting uh, purposes, you still need to know which web transport session it belongs to. So in that situation, you would send a stop sending at frame that would still allow you to receive the web transport session ID. Um, we do have some, some text in the PR that I linked here. Um, still needs to be updated um, to the new name, but we could, we could make this change pretty, pretty quickly. Any thoughts on that? We, we have some people in the queue. If you would like to respond to the stop sending at discussion. Hanu, you are still in the queue from last time. Uh, if you have something to say now, otherwise I'm going to skip to Jonathan. Oh, yeah, Jonathan Lennox. So to be clear, this means that the receiver has to know what's in the stream it didn't receive, right? Um, it, it, which is, I mean, which assumes certain structures of, I mean, if you assume if the web transport header is always a fixed size, then that works. If it's a variable size, Already, if, if if whatever is the the header you need for the accounting is a fixed size, that works. If it's a variable size, this is not useful. Right? In, in, yes, uh, okay. in, in general, yes. In in web transport, it's a it's a variable length integer, so you know that the maximum length is uh, eight. So, so that's what you would say. So you know the maximum length. Okay, yeah. It still seems a little weird to to have to know something you didn't get, but I guess sometimes you do. Yeah. I had the same question. Even if you know the length. How do you decide if you don't know which um, stream it is? How do you decide that you don't need to receive it without because, knowing the number? Because you, you send like the go go away, like you're you're draining the square connection. Are you draining the whole connection, Mike? So my comment is similar. I feel like we probably are still okay with stop sending because you send stop sending when you've read enough of the stream to know that you don't need any more. And the case where, say, you've read enough of the header to recognize what the cutoff is going to be at which point you don't need any more, probably that data is already in flight and wait a few milliseconds, it'll be there. Um, I don't strongly object to this. I'm just not convinced we need it. 
yeah, as I said, I, I think the use case is not as clear cut as for, for a reset stream ad. Like there's, there's the, the aesthetic argument that it, it restores some symmetry to the draft. <laughs> uh, Victor on remote. Uh, so uh, I'm not in, yeah, I, I have the same concern about it. And I guess my other observation is that stop sending already kind of acts as enough in the sense that there is nothing preventing you from replying to stop sending with a reset stream ad instead of reset stream if you know it has some constraint like related like it's a web transfer data stream me I insert myself as an individual. I think I do like the symmetry of this. If I remember correctly, I've been looking in ABT core and watching RTP over quick. And this question has come up. Is there such a feature? Oh, there's been something proposed. This could be useful. Maybe it wouldn't. That is maybe tying up progress on RTP over quick that you know, they, they would like to be done or to wait for a decision to be made. So I think we should try and decide quickly or not. Um, I, what I don't appreciate as an individual is, is really how much, how much this is complexifying implementation or the spec. To me, it doesn't seem that much. And if so, would anyone object to just putting it in? Um, and if, or if people want it, would they be actually willing to interrupt? That's a question as an individual, not a chair. Um, and I'll try and do some back showing to see what this all means. Thanks. David. Um, David Skenazi, quick enthusiast. So I can appreciate that there's some symmetry here, and I will say that we don't care. The ITF does not make pretty protocols. It makes protocols that work when we're lucky. Um, like this looking and feeling good is not a good reason to put something in a draft. Uh, so I would, I'm very sympathetic to the concerns that have been said before. It seems kind of nonsensical to say, stop sending at I don't know what. Uh, you could even end up in some weird situations. So unless someone has a clear use case for this, I would strongly object to putting this in. It's adding work for everyone for, and no one has been able to give a use case yet. Mira? Mira could even get everything David said. And also if you really need this, you can just have another extension and have it. Uh, I point out that uh, application protocols as complex as needing something like this can always implement this in the application space. The reason we have stopped sending in quick VUI is probably because we wanted to duplicate the functionalities of TCP that provides us bidirectional reset as a transport feature. But TCP doesn't have something like stop sending at all. It can always be an application protocol feature in case of quick. Okay, and Mo, I'm cutting the queue by the uh, way as well. A few concrete use cases do come to mind. Um, uh, being able to deliver uh, headers that you know are important without their payloads is very uh, useful in media applications. So I can envision mock eventually using something like this for when you know that you're not able to get all of the segments that you intended to, but you still want the media headers because they give you really critical information, sometimes information that's required to continue decoding the rest of the stream that you are gonna be receiving. So I think this would be very useful in cases where you know there's a fixed chunk of data, may only be a few bytes, maybe 10, 15, 20 bytes, but you don't wanna receive the entire 20 kilobyte payload after it. Um, this would be very useful to at least get that first chunk that's critical for other steps later. And Mike? Just wanted to repeat something that I said in the chat that if we don't do this, I would definitely support a text change to clarify that receiving a stop sending can elicit either a reset stream or a reset stream at. Okay. Because that is very useful for the media case where the server knows where its headers ended. Okay, I hope the authors noted that request. Okay. Um, I would just say, uh, looking at some of the chat and hearing some of the comments, uh, to my mind, this, a lot of this is kind of, you're going to stop sending at some big number. 
like you're going to overcommit to guarantee you receive the data you really want and you could just wait until you receive more data it's potentially an optimization and uh, optimizations at the cost of complexity to the protocol don't necessarily sit that well with me as an individual but let's move on yep okay i'm, I'm a little bit confused here because i'm getting um, getting mixed feedback I, I would like to, to ship a new draft version of this and potentially enter working group last call soon. Yep. So um, we need to resolve this one way or the other. Sure. And I would like to have a decision what we what we will do. Another another show of hands. Make my fingers work hard today. Um, I'm going to make this easy. Uh, do you want stop sending at y yes or no? Does that seem like a fair question? <laughs> I'm seeing lots of nods. Uh, oh, sorry, stop sending at in this draft. If somebody wants it and wants to come along later. Um, Lucas, okay. could I say a quick thing while you're typing? Sure. Um, just so stop sending carries an application layer error code. So for any protocol, like the example where you would want to have metadata, you could send stop sending with an error code that means by the way, reset stream at after the metadata or after the web transport stream ID. So I think we can solve all of this without stop sending at. Okay, thanks. Uh, I, I'm gonna start the poll. Please get in the tool and make your vote. I wanna be quick oh, okay. here. Uh, we're seeing a, a clear pattern emerging that uh, a lot of no's. So, yeah, let's terminate. Well, that's, that's nice. Yes, that's clear, this is clear a clear decision. signal. We yeah. will, of course, Thank you for that. take this to the list and do a consensus uh, call. But from what we see here, uh, we have two yeses. There was four at some point. People have changed their minds. 13 no's, uh, 110 no opinions, until participants 142. So, yeah, thank you for that. Thanks for the discussion. Um, Let's move on. Okay. The, the second issue is um, the draft currently says that you can, you can, you can send um, reset stream at for a certain offset. And then you can, at a later point, send another um, reset stream at frame with a, with a smaller reliable size. So the last part is important here. You can only ever reduce the size. You can never increase it because you don't know if the, if the receiver has already delivered everything um, up to the application and declared that it's done with the stream. Um, this is in the draft. It's, um, I, I, I found it easy to implement in, in, in my stack, uh, but there was some discussion in an issue if, um, if we want to keep this around. Uh, Martin Duke, Google, how, how can you guarantee that that like it arrives in the order that it is always decreasing like w with like losses of your transmissions could you end up accidentally increasing it so so, so this is the same as with, with with flow control updates we say like uh, when, when you receive a frame you check if if it increases the offset okay so you just so it's actually the lowest of all the and and here it's yeah you, you 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 only act upon the reset stream at frame with the lowest reliable size that you ever received. cool thanks Victor? Uh, I think that makes sense, and we still want to support reset stream regular for reset stream at, and reset stream regular is kind of equivalent to reset stream at zero. So that just it uh, it should be fine if I encounter that this is not fine during implementation. I will make sure to complain, but. <laughs> Is that, yeah. is that clear enough to the authors? Yep. Yeah, this is, this is very, um, very helpful feedback. And it means that we don't have to change the current version of the draft, which makes the editors happy. OK. So um, I guess this is a question for the chairs. Um, we can, we can uh, cut a new draft version basically right now, since we don't need to make any changes. Um, are we starting working group X call anytime soon? The, from what I've gauged from this discussion, I, I think that's probably a thing we should do, but I will need to confer with my co-chair. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not happening this week. And 
we'll respond and let people know either way. But yeah, uh, thanks. And I, I want to remind folks that this, this extension is an enabling technology for other working groups. We were able to adopt this pretty quickly and turn it around. Um, so I'm, I'm very, very pleased with, with that. It's been good work from all involved. Of course, if there's implementations, just keep going and, and maybe you know, try and find any bugs while we're doing that working group last call. Great, thank you, Martin. David is still in the uh, queue. Oh, just, David, uh, sorry. Speaking just as a chair of the web transport working group that's relying on this, thank you for doing it quickly. That's been really great and appreciated. It's gonna help us a lot. Thanks. Cool. Uh, now we've got Robin uh, with QLog. <laughs> Oh, Robin's asked to share slides. I don't know. Oh no, are you gonna are you gonna progress or? I. <laughs> Mira is coming to my rescue. Hang on a moment. Where's the key? Here. Yeah, are you sharing already? I. Let me stop. There we go. Oh, look at that. Hey. Hey. Okay. Oh. Nice. You attended my UFMRG uh, talk earlier, Jonathan. You'd know why I didn't attend the uh, training schedule for this. Anyway, sorry, Robin. Please, please regress. All right. Hello there. Uh, last time we had the Barbie update. So this time, of course, we need to have the Oppenheimer update to close the loop. Uh, Oppenheimer is, is up for today because we are dropping a big bomb on you. Uh, maybe we'll see. Uh, there's been relatively little progress in the draft since last time. Uh, we have added some ECN events and we had some editorial updates. We removed the IANA considerations because we don't think there are any. Um, but then the main thing we need to do today is get your input into issues that we didn't merge yet uh, because they're relatively big or sensitive. First of all, the easy thing though, we added ECN, explicit congestion notification. Um, we think what we added is sufficient to support whatever is needed there in the full state machine. Uh, however, if there are any ECN enthusiasts that would like to take a second look at this, even though it's merged already, that uh, would of course always be welcome. And then the big one uh, that we want to discuss today is to maybe remove QPAC from the core QLog documents and to move it to its own document and postpone it until later. <laughs> Why is that? We currently do have conceptual QPAC support, but it's very close to the wire image. You have events called things like set dynamic table capacity instruction or literal header, literal header field with name, which were of course very easy to pronounce and immediately clear what they do. Uh, but still people want some more high level um, events probably there as well. Things like indicating when something was head of line blocked by a late QPAC instruction, for example, or when things were added or removed from the dynamic table. And those are the kinds of events that we currently lack and that would arguably most would be most interesting to more high level implementers or debuggers of higher level stacks. We've tried this for a long time, but we can't seem to find people with actual um, implementation experience or debugging experience of QPAC stacks that can tell us which of these events would actually work best in practice. For this type of uh, this type of debugging, so basically we don't really know what these high-level events should look like to be most useful, um, and so we would be like fantasizing about what might be best. So we we would be doing the equivalent of no running code or no interoperability, which is not something we're looking most forward to. Um, second issue here is that this is currently actively blocking progress, so we think this is the last big thing would be needed to fix for, for even thinking about a working group last call in the future. And so one potential solution would be to move this to a separate document um, to be tackled later. So move it out of the cure, the, the, the core QLog documents uh, and then tackle it later. We have some precedent for that. We have many quick things like multipaths or reliable stream resets that we just saw. Those of course also won't be in the QLog core documents. So that's possible. It's just that this was previously agreed upon that it would be in the core documents. And then now we're proposing to move it out. I think all the editors currently agree that this is the better option to allow us to make progress. But if any of you have a different opinion, 
and preferably also an idea of what the high level events should look like, then uh, you should probably speak up uh, now or on the mailing list. I think we have people in the queue, so. Yeah, I put myself in just as a as an author, just to clarify that when, well, maybe what Robin made it clear, I just wanted to reiterate the point. When we say move, it doesn't mean the text we have would go somewhere directly. It means somebody else would go and do all of the work that we don't or can't do right now. Um, we have a PR, which is just deleting everything that's in there already. That text was, was the text that was in the adopted document, hence why we want to make sure that the working group is happy if we were to take it out. Uh, that's all. Uh, I'll let the folks in the queue go. So, Alan. Alan Frindell, uh, Meta and QPAC enthusiast. I, um, I think I had commented on the issue in QLog, or at least I had worked with Luca, who maybe relayed the comment when we put our heads together about what the high level events would look like. And so did that maybe not get to you or it was the information was there but not translated to a PR in a timely way and it's blocking you now? I would suggest Lucas take this one. <laughs> I, I would say uh, that did make it through to us, uh, but as, as uh, having a PR is just step one. Um, you know, we, we're short of cycles um, this isn't pointing fingers at anyone, reviewers or proponents of the things, but um, just having some stuff doesn't necessarily mean it's it's correct for everyone. You folks have done done your things, that's great, but other implementers might need stuff that's slightly different. And what we're not seeing is any implementers want this. Mm -hmm. And if those events aren't useful, this is just more text and more things to, to have to do to delay us. And we would like to just to get this doc done yeah, so I understand. I mean, I think I, you know, I have done extensive Q debugging on our QPAC implementation using my own bespoke logging rather than QLog, since QLog is not an option, and I don't really have time to write the PR for you, and I don't really have time to uh, implement the the QLog events either. So the next time somebody says there's a QPAC issue, which by the way there never is, it's always a transport issue. Um, I'm not sure that I can help you. So if, it, if it's blocking you and there's nobody else who cares, then I, I'm okay with it. Okay, cool. I've locked the queue here, but we'll, we'll drain it. Brian, please. Having dealt on multiple occasions in my career with um, having to deal with uh, choices that were made around a single implementation for debugging and logging stuff, including one that I have to deal with in production every day. That was my own damn fault, nuke it. Okay. Thank you. Q. Oh, I can be heard now. Um, yeah, I say move this into its own document. QPAC is its own RFC, so it, its own specification for QLog makes sense. And if this is what everything's getting stuck on, when there are so many more useful things in QLog that we could just push to standardization, do it. Thank you. And Mira? I just wanted to comment on the ECN part quickly, and maybe it's just an editorial issue, but maybe there's something. Can you go back one slide? Robin? Because it says like capable, and then it says like now sending with ECT0, but just because you're capable doesn't mean you also have to use it. Maybe it actually makes sense to keep that separately. And of course, you could also use ETC1 for FRS. And you can change that anytime, right? You test at the beginning, then the pass is capable, and then you decide anytime if you want to use it or not or whatever. Uh, okay. It, it sounds like we should talk to you some more and tweak their stuff, and that sounds pretty, pretty trivial to accommodate. So yeah, thanks for that feedback. Um, I'm, as, I'm not hearing anyone objecting to the QPAC thing. So again, we'll, we'll probably take this to the list and just make sure everyone who maybe isn't here has an uh, ability to object. But otherwise, it seems clear we should just remove this thing. Please progress, Robin. Yes. So the next big thing that has been around for a while is how to deal with uh, path stuff and connection migration and associating IP imports with individual events. Uh, we've been dancing around that for a long time. People had opinions, but no clear uh, proposals. So I went, decided to go ahead and launch a first proposal, right? So this is what I think is sufficient, uh, but as, as a starting point of more discussion. So the idea would be to just have a path field for each individual event, uh, like a top level field is what you would call it, next to the timestamp and the name and, and the data, you would have a path. 
And the part is the string. The string can be anything. Um, you can encode the IPs and the and the ports and the connection ID in there directly, which is somewhat okay for IPv4, somewhat less okay maybe for IPv6. As we can see, you could only encode the connection ID. You can encode a hash of these things if you don't want to lock the, the stuff directly for privacy reasons. You could even choose any type of string that only makes sense to you in your own private implementation. Um, anything goes, right? Now, the thing is, if we would have only this, um, this would be kind of annoying if you really want to have this, this magical state formatting inside of the path ID. So what I propose to do is to just have the path ID to be anything you like, and then have a separate event that couples the path ID string to the specific metadata you would like. In most cases, this will be your IP, your port, and then uh, one or more connection IDs. Um, so basically, the path ID will be can be very short, even just a number that you increment. And then the actual association with the path information happens in a separate event, which is currently called path assigned, but we can, we can bike shit that, of course. Uh, one of the nice properties of this is that you can keep updating this metadata. You just log a new path assigned event with same path ID, but with new uh, path endpoint info, uh, what I've called it now. And you can also just have like a default path ID of empty string, which indicates you're not doing anything special with paths. You just have a normal quick connection without multiple paths or connection migration, which most people have been doing with Qlog. So that kind of is, is nicely backwards compatible um, there as well. So relatively simple, very generic, very flexible, but I think it covers a load and it makes it possible to associate path information with each individual event, um, which is what, what is often needed, I think, and which is still missing in Qlog. You could then use this if you have the path field and then you can look at the path response and path challenge frames and things like preferred address. And you could, tools can, can somehow come up with what the implementation is trying to do with connection migration just by that. I do think it's useful to also have like an explicit additional event to indicate when you're trying to do connection migration. So the tools don't, or, the, or the people looking at the Qlogs don't have to manually figure it out. You also have explicit events that tell you this is happening. We have other similar events in the Qlog there as well. So this is kind of superfluous, but it's nice to have this explicit indication if, if you need it uh, for some reason. Uh, and so that's what this new quick migration state updated event would uh, would add, which is especially interesting, I think, if, if the migration fails or you have to abandon a probing attempt or that kind of stuff, to log that explicitly and to maybe log a reason why you abandoned uh, the attempt there to make that easier to debug, basically. So in, in summary, um, basically, I just proposed to have a path, path ID for each individual event. This is then associated with necessary metadata in a separate event, so the path assigned event. This can keep the path ID very short, so it doesn't need to encode any information in itself. This also makes it much easier to make it privacy aware. You can much easier strip or skip logging IP imports and connection IDs. And then you can also be more explicit about the connection migration with one additional event. So it's a relatively small change conceptually that does what it should do. There was a lot of discussion last time as well uh, about, you know, the main thing you need is tooling support, um, also for things like multipath. I think this provides it. I discussed this a bit with uh, Quentin from the multipath team. And from, I'm definitely not a multipath enthusiast, sorry, uh, but from what I can understand from how multipath works and the connection ID stuff, this should work out of the box. And even if it does not, it should be trivially extendable to what multipath needs with, for example, a custom multipath assigned um, event to couple the path ID to, to whatever you need there. And then also have tools uh, make, make use of that. So that's basically the end of this. Um, ECN is added. I think we get a clear signal that we can uh, move cube back to a different uh, document. We'll see on the mailing list there as well. And then please take a look at the the path proposal, which is in the PR right now, which I think is a good starting point to, to moving forward. Just one thing to be aware of, we explicitly don't want to add full multi-path support in this yet. That is out of scope for the Q, Q log documents. 
But if whatever we come up with has, let's say, 99 multipath support, that would, of course, be the most excellent outcome. Thank you. Uh, Miria? Um, yeah, by adding a path ID, you can nicely cover this migration case where the path ID or the connection ID changes, but it's the same path, and then you have that notion as well. Mm -hmm. But uh, I feel for any kind of egg information or packet number information, you still need the connection ID because every t the connection ID changes, uh, the packet number space changes when the connection ID changes. So if you have this concept of path, you might still have the same path, but if you have a new connection ID, packet number doesn't make sense anymore. So you, you then need to know which, what, which connection ID was used in order to make sense out of the packet number. Yeah, so you, you can associate multiple connection IDs with a single path ID, as you, as you can see here on the slide as well. The connection IDs here are a, are a list instead of a single one. As far as I understand it, that should be sufficient, but I could be wrong. But then you, you receive an event that you say egg received, Right, and that has a pass ID and a packet number, and that's not sufficient to actually identify where it belongs. Okay, for multipath, not for quick by itself. For multipath, yeah. Okay. Yeah, the just to interject, we, we ideally want to focus on the core specs, but this sounds like something we could add like trivially later, probably. So we might want a bit more discussion. Uh, I put myself in the queue because I wanted to say um, Quentin multipath stuff and well, Quentin contributed connection migration to Cloudflare's quiche. Cloudflare's quiche does queue log that I maintain. I wonder if there's just a bit of maybe experimentation we could do Robin offline to see, you know, can, can we make this thing work and, and get some tooling to, to analyze it as well, to get some clarification. Mm -hmm. So we might come back to Miria as well with some questions there. But this, this is a big step in the right direction, I think. I've only just seen this today as well. So there was some thumbs up in the room as well, Robin. Um, so yeah, thanks for doing this. Um, uh, yeah, let's, let's progress on. We have next up on the agenda, Martin Seaman with Nat Traversal. The what? Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I do not want to share my screen. Yeah, I'm here to talk about peer-to-peer uh, -peer quick, and I've submitted um, two drafts for that. And we'll start with the first one, which is a um, pretty easy one, and I don't want to spend too much time on this. Could I get the time on this? Uh, yeah, just hang on one moment. Um, next slide. So, um, the, 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 okay, thanks. Um, the question is, um, I assume you are running a quick node in, in a home network or a corporate network or behind any kind of firewall, behind any kind of NAT. Um, you don't know the public IP address of that node. So what you can do is, because we designed the quick header, um, to be uh, demultiplexable with other UDP-based protocols, in particular with the STUNT protocol, as we discussed earlier today, um, you can run a UDP socket and then run STUN on that socket and run QUIC on the same socket. Then you can use STUN to contact any STUN server that you like, uh, learn your public IP address, um, and then you can also run QUIC traffic on the same socket. So that works. Uh, next slide. But what if, we, what if we could do all of this in quick so we don't have to do any demultiplexing so we can use the um, quick grease bit extension and we just don't have to run like multiple, um, multiple things on the, same, um, on the same socket. That's what my draft describes. Um, so there's a, it defines a couple of frames. Um, one of them is a, a request address frame, which is sent on a path. Uh, and request the other peer to tell me the observed address on that path. And then it sends back an observed address frame with that address. Um, next slide. So not, the nice thing about 
doing this in Quake did is, I, did I next slide, yeah, okay. um, is that this beautifully works when you have multiple paths because you just can just send a request address frame um, on the other path as well and get a response there. Uh, next slide. The, as I said, the draft defines a couple of frames. We've already seen a request address. Um, we've already seen the response to that, which is an observed address frame. And there's a uh, request declined frame um, if you don't want to answer uh, such a request. Um, importantly, these frames don't only work um, in one direction from the client to the server side, but the server might be behind a net as well and might also want to learn, uh, might want to learn um, the address so they can be sent in the other direction as well. Um, all these frames are defined as probing frames, so you can send them during path validation and bundle them with your um, path challenges and path responses without actually committing to a new path. Next slide. Um, I would like to ask if there's interest in this kind of work uh, in, in, the, in the working group. Um, I've already sent this to the list and received a number of, of responses. Um, one of them was from, from Igor, and he was, um, he was asking if request response is the best solution here. And he proposed that this should be an unsolicited frame uh, that, that I can send whenever this, um, this extension is negotiated. And I want to tell my peer about uh, the IP address on a new path. I, I, could uh, the, I could just send the observed address frame without any request. I don't want to get into too much detail here in the interest of time, but I'm just saying that there's some, there's some work to do in, in, in that area. Uh, thank you for presenting this. I think this is fairly easy to implement. The, regarding this uh, question, I think the current request response uh, protocol without any flow control has the exact problems that we experienced with HTTP2 rapid reset attack. And I think uh, moving to what Eagle pre proposed makes perfect sense. And it also improves reliability, as you said. And regarding the previous slide, uh, I'd probably say that it, this frame doesn't have to be defined as a probing frame because we can always send this on the path that's already known to work. If we include the connection ID secrets number in the frame. Okay, yeah. Hi, uh, Colin Perkins. Um, so you can clearly do this and it will clearly work. Um, and in many ways, I think it's a good idea. Um, where I think I'm a little concerned is that um, we currently have one way of doing net traversal, which is widely used by a lot of different applications using Stump. And I'm a little concerned about fragmenting that so we have different ways of doing it. And as a result, people stop supporting Stump or start blocking Stump traffic um, because everyone, do, everyone important is using Quick uh, to do net traversal. And that then causes a bunch of, of other applications to break. So, I agree you can do this. I agree from the point of view of quick, this is a good idea. I think we should think a little bit about the wider implications if, of whether it makes sense to do it from a broader e ecosystem point of view, or whether we want to stick with just the one way of doing that traversal that everyone uses, even if that's suboptimal. Thanks, Colin. Uh, Mike Bishop. I agree that you probably don't want a request frame here, but I think the the way that you get a request is to separate your setting into separate, I'm willing to see these frames and respond to them. Well, I'm, I'm interested in receiving an observed address whenever you see my IP address change, and I understand what the setting is. Maybe you don't even need the second one. It's just, I don't uh, know. Well, yeah, you need the negotiation to agree that the frame exists. Yep. But you can have a separate setting for I would like you to send them. Yep, that makes sense. Peter Thatcher? Nope, Peter just left the queue. If you meant to hit, yep, 
speak. Sorry, meant to hit the unmute. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yes. So two questions. First, does this happen before or after the handshake? This happens during the lifetime of the connection and during the lifetime of the path. So it does allow you to observe uh, net rebindings. No, I, I just mean the, the crypto handshake. Do you have to do the crypto handshake before you send this or? Yes, these are frames that are sent in the application data packet number space. That means um, zero RTT and one RTT packet packets. Um, I don't see any use case for adding them in the, uh, in the initial packet because that would make them observable to on path um, to, to, to everybody on the path. And I just don't see why we would need to do that. So in the, w without zero RTT in, in the one RTT case, you'd have an extra round trip compared to stun. Is that correct? Because you'd have one RTT to do the handshake and then a second one for requesting and uh, retrieving yes, the address. I, I, I don't imagine that this would be a replacement for stun. So th this, this would be more applicable if you're running a peer-to-peer -peer node uh, that's handling a bunch of quick traffic anyway. And you are now using that quick traffic to also learn about uh, your address. But that's the whole reason for stun. Uh, so it seems like you're creating stun over quick, which is fine. I just want to understand the pros and cons. Um, another one is uh, authentication. So stun has a built-in authentication mechanism. Is there going to be a mechanism for authenticating to a server that's responding to these requests? I'm not sure what, what you would want to authenticate here be, be, um, beyond the encryption that uh, Quick already provides, but maybe I'm just unfamiliar with uh, what's done exactly does there. I, I, I don't want to get bogged down in technical details of a dra draft that's still in, you know, yeah. not even adopted yet. Can, can we move on to the other one? Uh, we have Mike in the queue. We, I don't want to run out of time for these things. So, um, okay, yep, let's move on. Um, I did see two other people come in after I locked that queue. I think okay. let's go through the next set of slides I, and, and keep your questions. I, I would need the other presentation. Yeah, yeah. That's uh, so that's about the um, actual quick net traversal. And I already did a speed run of that in, in San Francisco. Yeah. And now I have a little bit more time. <laughs> um, since San Francisco, I completely rewrote the draft based on feedback I got on the list and uh, in the room uh, back then. And um, Eric Kinnear from Apple joined as a uh, co-author co of the draft. Uh, next slide. Okay, so quick version one. In quick version one, um, the assumption is that the server is always publicly reachable. Um, we're very explicit about this uh, in the text. Only the client uh, might be behind a NAT or a firewall. Um, that's why we only have to deal with uh, NAT rebindings on one side of the connection. And um, we also say that uh, connection, connection migration also only happens um, from the client side because the server is um, probably in some kind of data center and has a stable IP address. Um, next slide. Next slide. So the purpose of this draft is to make a uh, quick uh, work in the peer-to-peer -peer use case, meaning where both nodes might be behind uh, a NAT or a firewall. Um, there's a bunch of use cases for this. For example, you could, you could imagine that once a WebRTC uh, over Quick is defined, you would need a way to get through these NATs to establish an actual peer-to-peer -peer connection for your video call. Um, but there's a lot of other peer-to-peer -peer protocols that would benefit from this as well. Next slide. Coming back to the question that was that was raised earlier, do we do do we need to do anything? We already have stun, we already have ice, and you can reasonably run ice on both endpoints. Um, let ice do all the all the net traversal, all the hole punching. Um, take some time, but at the end, um, if possible, you will end up with a peer-to-peer -peer path. And then you start your quick server and your quick client, and you can just establish a direct connection there. Um, 
downsides is obviously it takes time. This whole punching, um, whole punching requires like um, tra transmitting addresses back and forth. Uh, requires sending packets, retransmitting packets. Uh, so it takes a, it can, can take a couple of seconds. Um, also requires you to run ICE, um, which is something that you might or might not be willing to do. Um, it also run, uh, requires that you run a, um, a non-quick signaling server so that the two ICE agents can talk to each other. Next slide. So what if we could do all of this in quick? We could start from a proxy quick connection um, that would serve as a signaling channel between the two nodes. For example, our friends in the mask working group have been working on exactly that. It's called Connect UDP Listen. Um, and it allows a node to expose a, to, to ask the proxy to, to allocate a, a UDP port um, that other nodes can connect to. So we have a way for uh, two nodes behind a NAT to establish a, a direct connection between each other. A direct quick connection, which means we can already start whatever application protocol we want to run on top of this connection. So you could, you could, um, just establish the proxy connection and start start setting up your, your WebRTC session and start start your video call. You could then, the second step would be to use um, quick path probing as described in, in, in the RFC to, um, to actually create the net bindings that will then in the third step allow you to, um, to, um, to establish a direct path between the two nodes and migrate to that path. There's a slight change that's required to, uh, to what we've defined in RFC 9000, because in RFC 9000, um, it is only the client that initiates the path probe. The server doesn't send any, any probe packets un until it has heard from, from the client. So we need, to, we need to allow that. Next slide. So the, let's, let's go a little bit into detail how these steps work. Um, in the first step, the we set up the proxy quick connection and we, we um, negotiate the extension that I'm, that I'm proposing here. Um, the server then sends a list of address of its uh, public addresses to the client. And how, how it derived these addresses doesn't really matter here. It could have used done or it could have used the, uh, the extension that I just presented earlier. Um, these addresses go into a, a new frame that we are defining. It's called an ad, ad address frame. Um, it can be sent all at once, or the server can also trickle these addresses. What trickle is like ICE terminology for like, oh, I'm discovering an address a little bit later, and now I'm also sending it to the client. The important bit here is that this is this is a one directional thing. Only the server is sending the addresses. The client is never send, transmitting its addresses to the server. Um, next slide. The client then receives the service addresses and it goes through its own list of, of IP addresses, of public IP addresses that it has and forms the candidate pairs. You have very similar logic um, like this in uh, defined in ICE, where you pair addresses that could potentially be on the same network and that could potentially be um, allow you to, to, um, to establish a direct path. So for example, if you have an IPv6 six address, you would of course, like the, the other address that you're connecting to would also need to be an IPv6 address. And there's various rules about like um, local and, and like public IP addresses. How exactly the client does this matching doesn't really matter because it's only happening on the client side, but I don't see why we, we couldn't just reuse the logic that's um, described in the, in the ICE RFC. Uh, next slide. Um, next step. The client now takes all these all these pairs that it has uh, generated of, of IP addresses and sends them um, to the server. So now both peers have uh, the same view of what's going on. Like these are like three three possible combinations of of um, path of direct path between the two nodes. Now both uh, both of them uh, send probe packets. These are um, normal quick um, quick probing packets. Uh, to see if the path is actually um, is actually a viable path. By sending these packets, this creates the NAT bindings in the routers on both sides that will then allow the other peers packet to make it through. So this is the whole punching step. Timing is a little bit critical here. Um, so you need 
you, you obviously need to create the binding in your router before the other peers packet can make it through. So it might be necessary to, to retransmit, um, retransmit the packet uh, after a short while um, to catch some corner cases. So now let's assume, sorry, previous slide. Um, <laughs> Let's assume that the NATs are well behaved and we can, we can actually punch through them. And we, end, we might end up with one path, that, with a direct path between two nodes, or we might even end up with multiple paths. Um, these are now uh, inactive paths um, according to, to what quick version one defines, but now the client can initiate a quick connection migration and migrate the entire connection to, to a, a direct path. Next slide. So th this, is, um, this is really nice because we started with a connection. We already started the, the, the video call on the proxy connection. And all of this, what I, what I described was happening in the background and the user didn't notice anything of this. And now that we have the direct path, the call, the call can continue on, 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 a, on a more optimal, um, a more optimal, route, optimal route between the two peers. Um, a question that I, 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 got, I, I get basically every time that I, I present this is, do we need, do we need to make a um, quick multipath a requirement of this? And I don't think we need to do this because in both quick version one and in quick multipath, um, clients are already allowed to, to probe multiple path at the same time. Um, similarly, in both v, v1 and in multipath, the server is not allowed to probe path. So we need, to, we need some additional logic to, um, to allow the server to actually do that. The advantage you get from multipath is, well, obviously you can use multiple paths, um, but that's just an optimization that you can get. It's not a requirement for, for this extension to work. Uh, next slide. This is a pretty early draft version. Um, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, and there's a lot more open questions than I, than I put on the slide. Uh, for example, you might, um, you might want to probe a lot of paths at the same time. And um, probing a new path requires you to have a connection ID. And usually quick implementation set an active connection ID limit of like three or four. So you might, you might run into this limit pretty, pretty quickly. Um, the other thing that, that was brought up in AVT core when I presented it in San Francisco was that there's um, that you need a little bit of bandwidth for the, the path probing. And in some, uh, in some cases that might be more than, than is available to you. I'm not sure how, how critical this is and how common this is, but this is something that, that we need to think carefully about. Um, and then the last one is kind of important. Um, the client is asking the server to dial um, many addresses in parallel or to send probe packets to many uh, addresses in, in parallel. So we need to be careful here that we don't create an amplification vector. This is not a new problem. We already have this during the, the quick handshake and we have this during, um, during connection migration, um, but we need, to be, we need to be careful here that we don't build a, an amplification gun. Okay, um, we are at time. We have four people in the queue. I'd like to hear from them, but if they could be very brief, that would be uh, amazing. Peter? Could you scroll back a couple slides to the one where you were saying something along the lines of we don't do ice? Which one? I don't Right I there. Don't this one. That's, yeah, that's the one. So <clears throat> when you say it doesn't, in this new way doesn't require running ice, I think a better way of saying that would be you're doing ice. It's just you're using quick packets instead of stun, pack stun packets because you're using all the same techniques, right? And um, while I, I think that that's uh, a very interesting idea to explore, it's also going to be a, a lot of work uh, after experiencing doing ice biz. Um, and so I think it would be very important to enumerate the benefits that we expect to get from doing it, replacing stun packets with quick packets, basically. The, the two other things down on this list I don't think are accurate as uh, benefits. I could think of, say, seven or eight benefits off the top of my head, but I think before delving into a tremendous amount of work, we should really 
understand the uh, the benefits we'd get and have a good understanding of the amount of work, which I think is quite significant. Thank you, uh, Jonathan. Um, yeah, so um, the first point is I think in most cases, certainly for the WebRTC use cases, you're still going to need some sort of rendezvous server since a server that's behind a NAT isn't going to have a, a, certi a certificate signed by a CA. So if you have, if you have self-signed certs, you're gonna to need to exchange fingerprints, um, which is going to require the out-of-band signaling server before you can get your quick connection up. Um, so at which point I feel like, you know, the sort of the somewhat convolutions you go to do not need a, that pre, that, that early, that um, not need that signaling server. It doesn't actually gain you anything because you still need to exchange fingerprints. Um, the other thing is that this does require that the um, server maintain a publicly routable um, address. You know, it, it may be on a, on a mask server, but it's a publicly routable address. ICE doesn't actually require that. ICE, with TURN, you only accept connections from the other side's candidates. And so I'm worried that that's more exposure because anybody can just start probing you and try to connect to you. I mean, obviously the fingerprint exchange, it's not as big a deal, but it's still a little worrying. Um, so I, I mean, I, which I think you could, might be able to get away with that if you do have the, the external free exchange, the external rendezvous, but I need to think about, and probably we should talk about that offline. I, I, I do, do you have time after this? We can. Okay. Uh, Colin, can please be as brief as possible. Hi, uh, the, Colin Perkins, the brief version is, I agree with Pete Thatcher. Okay. Um, the, the reason ICE works is because of the matching algorithm and because of the multiple round trip times and the probing. That's spectacularly hard to get right, and you are not going to be able to beat it by, by re-implementing this in quick. So I would really urge caution. There's a lot of hidden complexity in ICE, and the timing and the, the multiple round trip times and the process is critical for, to making it work. Can I just respond to that? Yep. Yeah, so... so... In the very first version of this draft, the, the one that I presented in San Francisco, we were um, basically duplicating what we're doing in ICE. This one is not duplicating what we're doing in ICE because the address matching is only happening on the client side. So re you remove a lot of the um, a lot of the logic that's required to make to make sure that both peers are hole punching the same address at the same time. I I would urge you to check check that that works really thoroughly because a lot of the complexity in ICE was because people found corner cases months after the initial algorithm was specified. And we had a horrible, horrible time defining the initial version of ICE because people kept finding cases where it didn't work. So if you simplify that, be really careful. Okay, thanks, Colin. Uh, Luke, very, very briefly, please. Yeah, uh, agree with everybody in the queue. Um, and I also say, do we need an extension for this? Could we have something on top of Quick that just shares the IP address? Like, you know, stun. I think there's a layering thing here too. Thanks. Um, this is like the second time this has come to the working group. There's people who seem to feel passionately about different aspects, whether it's a technical solution or not doing the work at all, um, or that it could be hard. I think what we're probably looking for is, is there sufficient interest that, that NAT related work should be done in the quick working group. Um, and the amount of work to actually do is, is a factor of that too. So I think I'm not talking about adoption or anything right now, but I think it would help to get a clear signal of, of, of interest in trying to do that. And that is probably a discussion with the BAD as well about these kinds of things, given the relationship to other uh, working groups in, in the area. So I, I want to take a very quick show of hands. Mm -hmm. This is probably going to be a really badly written question, which is going to be, is there, are you interested in adopting NAT related work into the quick working group? Sorry, doing NAT related work in the quick working group. NAT related in general. I don't want to make it specific to any particular draft or proposal. If you have something great, if not, if there's other people who want to suggest ideas um, too, then that's a discussion we can have later on. And I can't type. Okay, I'm going to start that, and we need to be 
brief. So just answer as quickly as you can and then we'll wrap things up. If we had more time, I would ask anyone saying no to speak to the mic, we do not. But if you want to take your opinions in favor or against to the mailing list, that would be great. Or directly to the chairs, that would be very helpful. Um, so I'm not against it, I'm just not interested, right? That's what you're asking. Yeah. That's a bad question. Hey, <laughs> where's my co-chair? Okay. For the record, we'll stop that. Uh, that's 135 particip 134 participants, 20 yes, 11 no, and 103 no opinion. Um, let me go away and digest those numbers and speak to some people. Um, thanks, Martin. Great. Okay, next step. We are compressed on time, and we have a few other things in the as time permits. So the accuracy timestamps, I'm not sure who is presenting that on behalf of Meta. If... Hi, this is Sharad, uh, and I'm ah, calling yes. from Menlo Park. Great. Would you like me to run the slides for you? Or... Uh, yes, please. This one. Okay. Go ahead, Sharad. Right. Hi. Uh, so I'm Sharad Jiswal, and I work at Meta. And uh, we want to start a discussion about uh, reviving uh, an RFC draft, uh, uh, which which is a quick extension uh, uh, to, to basically describes a variant of the ACK uh, frame uh, that allows uh, the receiver to convey to the peer timestamps on when packets were received. Uh, we have uh, implemented this draft here at Meta uh, with uh, applications that range from bandwidth estimation to condition detection that we will touch on time permitting, right? So, uh, so uh, very quickly, uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, the time sums and when packets are sent and received are already a critical ingredient of uh, round trip measurements and bandwidth estimations and quick. Uh, uh, one issue with the uh, with the existing granularity of measurements is that it all depends on the frequency at which uh, ACK packets are sent by the receiver. So uh, let's assume that that uh, uh, you know uh, a, a common frequency would be let's say 20, and and we get an ACK packet every 20 packets. And if there are any network fluctuations that affect a subset of packets of these packets or happen at a time scale that's uh, uh, shorter than when the act was sent, then, then these conditions will currently be obfuscated uh, in terms of, of what we can infer about them. The next time, next, next, next slide, please. And uh, this, this, this problem becomes particularly interesting or important when you're dealing with uh, latency sensitive applications uh, and, and at the intersection of these applications and say wireless networks, where, where both the scheduling algorithms and condition, conditions can uh, you know, emerge at short time scales and can still impact the application. So, uh, so, so, uh, so, so the, 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 the new draft, the, the draft that we wanna talk about, let's go to that quickly. Uh, next slide. So uh, this was a draft that was submitted by uh, Smith and uh, Suet et al, uh, uh, I think last year. And uh, we found it interesting, and we went ahead and implemented it. Uh, I will, in the interest of time, not go into a lot of details about uh, the implementation details of the draft, but uh, we'll quickly summarize some of the salient points. Um, the, the, the extension basically involves an initial transport negotiation uh, in which the peer conveys, uh, sorry, in which the, uh, each endpoint conveys with peer uh, how many timestamps it expects to receive uh, from, from the endpoint, right? And and uh, and whether the timestamps are enabled. Uh, it also conveys an exponent that that is basically a signal to what's the granularity at which uh, it expects to receive these timestamps, or what's the granularity at which these timestamps are encoded. Uh, next slide, please. Now. This is the, the this is the uh, this is the basically the meat of the extension. So the uh, the extension basically is proposing a new frame, the act receives time times frame, uh, which basically carries all the fees that exist in the current act frame, and and the the the, the new fields basically uh, uh, encode uh, 
uh, how many timestamps are being sent and, uh, and, and, and some information about uh, 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 how they're being sent. So, so let's talk through that quickly since that's, I think, uh, somewhat important. So the basic idea in the extension is that the timestamps are sent as ranges. Okay, and each range describes a series of contiguous packet received timestamps in, in descending sequential packet number and uh, timestamp order. So, so, so and, and each range consists of a gap indicating the largest packet number in that range, uh, followed by a list of timestamp deltas describing the relative received timestamps for each of those packets. So uh, the next slide sort of ex explains this a bit more pictorially, Can if we go there. Right, so, so, uh, uh, so yeah, so, so each, each, the timestamps are encoded as ranges, just like act clocks are, and as I mentioned, the gaps indicate uh, 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 the, the so, and, and, and the critical aspect of this encoding is that timestamps are not sent for out of order packets. So, so gaps indicate when pack, so which of those gap, gaps are indication of the out of order packets, and and the deltas are indication of what's the what's what's the time uh, difference when the packet is received versus the previous packet. So. Right. So this is how this is what the RFC has now. Uh, let's go to a minor extension we did to it, uh, which is in the next slide. So uh, uh, as I mentioned, the, the RX timestamps are not sent for out-of-order packets, and and uh, one one ex, uh, one one extension we did in our implementation to also convey uh, what was the latest received packet number. And the latest received packet time delta was uh, for when when the, when this act when this act received time from frame was sent. Now, uh, having this information is actually quite useful uh, because assuming that an act was sent for an out of order packet, then then uh, it it lets us know that this this act particular act was sent for an out of an out of an order packet, and uh, assuming that you know the previous act for assuming an act for the actual largest packet that was received was lost, uh, it, it tells you that, that, that basically, uh, it, it actually helps you correct uh, a faulty RTT measurement that could have been done uh, because this, this would basically have been an act that was, that, that was delayed because of an out of order packet. So, so, uh, so, so this is actually another interesting aspect of this RFC that uh, these received timestamps not just give you a more fine-grained visibility into network conditions, but we believe with some extensions, it can also convey a lot of interesting information about uh, when out-of-order packets happened and what was the extent of the delay of the out-of-order packets. Right, so uh, let's move on in the interest of time. So this is just an uh, illustrative example of how we are using these RX timestamps at Meta. Uh, this gray box in the middle basically is, is just an abstraction of some kind of a wireless scheduler. This could be a base station or a Wi-Fi scheduler. And the basic idea is that, that uh, as congestion occurs, then, then uh, I mean, it, it, it manifests. Let's assume that the, uh, 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 packets were sent in a burst from the sender. Uh, when congestion occurs in the last mile link, it manifests in either uh, packets uh, burst getting aggregated uh, uh, at, at wireless link or basically getting spread out further, right? So, so uh, basically matching the RX timestamps with the sender timestamps and, and looking at these patterns of the interarrival times of bursts, so the size of the bursts, we have found them to be a pretty useful signal in, in detecting uh, when, when, for example, the network rates went down uh, due to uh, due to actual contention and congestion in wireless networks, and and also for basically more fine grained bandwidth measurements that that have been very useful for uh, especially low latency video applications. So that's the that was the second slide after this, uh, which I kind of did give a preview of before this. Right. Sh sure. So, so we're have, very yeah. short time, Jared. Can we can we wrap this yeah. up? In... So I think I think I'm pretty much at the end. Uh, let's go to the final slide. Yep. So so uh, so so yeah. I just want to pause and gauge interest from the room. Uh, firstly, of 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 reviving this uh, RFC draft uh, for which we have already implemented and got some real world experience out of. 
Uh, and, and I also want to particularly ask a specific question on whether there is interest in expanding on this draft to carry more information uh, of, of, uh, about, about out of order package to this draft currently. Uh, uh, does not touch upon that as much. But we could uh, carry more information about all of other packets uh, that we believe uh, could actually uh, uh, be particularly useful in in uh, in other quick proposals like you know tariffs and so forth, where the extent of order of ordering may be even higher than uh, 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 than typical network conditions. So, so that's, that's yeah, I'm going to I'm going to stop you there. We're we're at time or over time, and we had some other as time permits talks that we've not been able to get to, and I'm very sorry to those people. Um, we have some people in the, we haven't got the time for that discussion. Uh, there is there's been a few uh, drafts related to this topic. I would encourage people who are interested in it to discuss some more, and maybe come come back to the list with more experimental data or more proposals, and we can discuss that. Um, we did have. Uh, some topics talk about FEC and quick and to give some data about people's experiments. Uh, we don't have the time to get to that, I'm afraid. Again, I'm sorry. But uh, Francois Michel is going to be presenting at the MOQ group. Uh, I can't remember what session that is, but uh, please look that up in the agenda uh, for that. We also had uh, Gori, who's going to present about the BDP frame. There's been some discussion about this on the list. I think. Um, again, that's a good discussion. We can carry that on there. Again, Gary, I'm very sorry about that. We'll make sure anyone who missed out on time this time around, uh, if they want to come in at the next IETF meeting, um, we will we'll make sure that they get the opportunity there. Um, okay. With that, I will wrap up this session. Uh, thank you all. I think we've made some very good progress on the adopted working group drafts such that we can get those cleared so that new items have a bit more time for discussion or potential new items. Uh, thank you all again. Thank you to our scribes and um, Jonathan Morton and Miria and everyone else who helped me today. And um, a virtual goodbye, Sharad.